traditions. Okay, good morning, everybody. Let's, uh, let's get started. Um, here's hoping that all of you have submitted deliverable six, and you now have a KNN that can recognize all 10 digits from your hand using data from some, but maybe not all of your fellow students. Submitted does not mean succeeded. Okay. How many have a KNN that can recognize two digits, three digits, four digits, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten? Okay. More than half of you, I'd say. That's fine. Okay. If you haven't, carry on with deliverable six. Obviously, through deliverable seven through ten, you're going to need to have a KNN that can recognize all ten digits. If you are still stuck, make sure to come and see the TA or, or see myself during office hours, and we will help you as best we can. If you have a KNN that is not yet recognizing all 10 digits, that is okay. You can continue on with deliverable seven. So this is sort of the one exception to the, the cumulative projects uh, rule. But in parallel, do make sure you're working away at that. Any questions about deliverable six, deliverable seven? Uh, speaking of office hours, I unfortunately cannot make my office hours immediately after class today, but the TA will be hosting her office hours uh, as scheduled. If you need us and you can't make either the TA's or my office hours, let me know. Okay. All right. Uh, let's carry on. We are going to finish off. Yes. Sorry, quick question. Is yep. that scheduled? Uh, the TA, yeah, the TA's office hours were yesterday, right, on Wednesday, I think. Yes. Yes, right. They were, so they do Monday and Wednesday. But next Monday is... Ah, next Monday is a holiday. Good catch. That's right. I am not sure I would email Caitlin and arrange to meet with her earlier than Monday if you need her. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we will finish off our discussion about cognitive psychology today. Obviously, this is a vast subject, and we are just touching on a few relevant aspects of human cognition that relate to HCI. And we're going to finish today with the most subjective end of cognition, which is affect uh, or emotion. And we will then start in. Uh, we will start in today on the first of several lectures of the next theme in the course which is looking outward. So when we finish lecture 13 today, we will sort of be finishing the first half of the course, which is mostly theory and investigating some of the basic concepts that are relevant to HCI. And we're gonna spend the second half uh, of this course looking at many, many different case studies and applications to try and ground our understanding and intuition of these concepts in some new and emerging technologies, right? Computer science moves pretty quickly, AI moves even faster, but HCI moves even faster than that, right? So as I mentioned at the beginning of the course, there is an emphasis in this course on concepts. The concepts themselves don't change very much. Put humans first, rather than getting the technology to do what the technology can do. That concept is probably not gonna go away anytime soon. But how that concept is grounded in very different kinds of technology, that's the tricky part, right? That's, that's really the, the black art of HCI. So in order to really understand these concepts, we're gonna look at a lot of different applications of putting these ideas into practice. And of course, in your ASL educational game, you're also gonna have some hands-on experience with grounding the various concepts we've talked about in class, in technology. Sound good? Okay, so back to affective computing and this idea of affect, uh, the psychologist's name for uh, emotion. We're gonna break our discussion today down into three different aspects uh, of emotion. The first one is trying to get computers to recognize emotion in their human users, negative and positive. We then will discuss creating technologies that give the impression of having emotion, as we were just talking about before class, whether machines can have free will or actually have emotions, who knows? But there may be certain uh, domains in which it's helpful to create technology that at least projects the illusion of having emotions. And then finally, we'll talk about trying to create adaptive technologies that can recognize emotion and try and adapt their mode of operation to elicit positive emotions, hopefully, from their users rather than negative. 
Yet another specific challenge about HCI is typically we're not just creating a pretty interface, but we're trying to create an interface that intelligently adapts to the current user that's using it. Not a very easy thing to do. Okay, let's start with getting computers to recognize uh, emotion. How many of you have swore your computer? I know I, I certainly have, right? So a lot of the time the emotion is negative. Why would we want to have our technologies recognize it? Well, hopefully we can turn a frown upside down and get some positive emotion out of it. So what are the different ways in which we could think about creating a technology that adapts? Perhaps, and perhaps most of the time we would like our technology to become a little bit more passive uh, if our users are getting frustrated or distracted with lots and lots of notifications. So hopefully we could create some technology that backpedals a little bit and places itself in that quote unquote background, whatever that means. Okay. Generally speaking, change tactics if negative emotions uh, are, are detected. If the user is curious and is interested in what's going on, then maybe the opposite. Maybe the, the interface starts to provide more information about what's going on uh, under the hood, right? This can go either way. Uh, less information if the user is frustrated. Remember the current interaction if the user some in directly or indirectly signals sort of a positive interaction, right? That was great. That's the way I'd like to do this the next time we, we do this. Okay, so um, in order to recognize emotions from the computer's point of view, we need to understand a little bit of, of what em exactly emotions uh, are. As always in HCI, we're gonna walk through a, a series of objective and increasingly subjective views on emotion. Well, we can talk about the physiological or the behavioral correlates of behavior. Uh, of emotion. Emotion is obviously an internal thing, but there are a lot of external cues that are given off of emotion, trembling with fear, blushing with embarrassment. You can think of your own uh, examples. We can think about the physiological responses on the surface uh, of the body or expressed through uh, the face, and then their behavioral responses, pulling back, looking inwards. If you're confused or curious about what's going on, you can think about head or actual bod body movements that also give hints about the affective state of the user at a given time. And then there is obviously the subjective experience uh, itself. What does it feel like to be angry or upset or curious or frustrated or distracted? This is often known as cognitive labeling. After we've experienced the emotion and in retrospect, we look back at our own emotional state, we label it with some sort of emotion, right? So uh, there was something that was uh, surprising that was put up on the screen. My pulse spiked and I pulled back quickly away from the screen. If you ask me after the fact what happened, I might give you different answers. I was surprised, I was scared. Humans are notoriously bad at self-reporting, right? On reporting on their own behavior after uh, the fact. Not surprisingly, because obviously this is a very subjective experience. It's often hard to articulate what's going on inside. Remember our discussion last week about thinking about thinking is misleading. So most HCI technologies that try and dip their toes in the sea of affect focus mostly on detecting the physiological correlates of emotion and we leave the subjective experience alone. We're gonna focus on just sort of obvious things that could be detected through a webcam or a wearable device that register something about a physiological response to a stimulus and then possibly adapting the interface given that uh, detection. Okay, so what kinds of physiological correlates are easiest to capture? Well, for most of us that have decades of experience with social interaction, we do this all the time. We do this mostly because we look at other humans' faces and we try and read cues on what's going on under the hood from facial uh, expressions. This is something that's been studied in psychology for a long time. Back in the 70s, Ekman and Ellsworth uh, did a, a cross-cultural study and found something interesting, which is if you focus on just the muscles in the face that are tensed, when a user reports after the fact they were angry, they were excited, they were curious, they were frustrated, the subsets of muscles that are tensed 
across cultures where the same emotion tend to be the same. So there was uh, an interesting debate in the 50s and 60s whether emotions, uh, the subjective experience of emotions, or the outward expression of those emotions, is it a cultural thing, or is it a deeper, more evolutionary thing? Way back in the 70s, the evidence seemed to tilt much more in favor of this being an evolutionary process. So facial expressions associated with emotions seem to go way, way back. As you can imagine, the, the, uh, the literature is still ongoing on this, but for our purposes, we're going to assume that for most people, we can recognize the emotions, or at least the emotions they're trying to signal through the face. By focusing on facial expressions, this helps us get a handle on quantifying emotion. If we're going to try and create machines that recognize facial expressions, this is a good place uh, to start. So we can measure emotions. Again, we're not sure about what's going on under the hood, but measuring the outward presentation of emotion by analyzing faces. Uh, the emotion uh, wheel is always fun, uh, proposed by Plutchnik back in the 1980s. As you can see, some of these emotions in the wheel are closer to one another than others. Why? Why is anger and disgust next to one another, but disgust and acceptance are on opposite sides of the wheel? We're gonna try and quantify emotion using facial expressions. Because anger and disgust are opposites, or? Anger or and disgust. Anger, just acceptance and disgust are opposites. Acceptance anger. and disgust are opposites. They're signaled as being opposites in the wheel, but why? Why do we feel that they're opposites? Positive and negative. Why do we attribute one being positive and one being negative? There's something about facial expressions corresponding to these that if we were to just focus now on the facial expressions associated with this, it seems that disgust and acceptance are further apart. Well, you're not, uh, I think they're like actually opposites where you're not disgusted by things that you're uh, accepting of and you're not accepting of things that you're disgusted. Okay, so they are actually opposites rather than just opposite because the facial expressions associated with them are very different. Remember our discussion way back at the beginning of the semester about, uh, about B.F. Skinner and the Skinner box. There were discussions and arguments for over 100 years about animal behavior, including human behavior, about what's actually happening inside the head of the animal or the human versus what the animal or the human actually does. From Skinner's point of view, he felt we could never agree about what was actually going on inside, and our only route to understanding behavior was to look at stimulus and response of the animal or stimulus and response of the human. You may be right about what's actually the case in terms of emotions. We're gonna set that aside today and only focus on what we can see on the surface of the human being, which in this case is going to be gestures and facial expressions. I think angry and disgust, the facial uh, expression will be more intensive. More intensive, and, yeah, okay. And the joy and acceptance, they will be more relaxed. Okay, so intense and relaxed facial expressions. So we're getting closer towards something objective that we can actually measure, right? We have a webcam that's recording a human face. How does the webcam recognize intense or relaxed, right? That's the tricky feature to capture. So can we get any closer? I made this little cartoon for fun just to see if we can do this. Obviously, these are not actually a human face. They're composites of different parts of different faces. So let's try and get a little bit closer to an objective quantitative measure of facial expression. Why is disgust and sadness next to one another? Okay, now we're getting close, right? So now we're talking about features of the curvature of the lips or open or closed, the angle of the brows. Now we're starting to get into a region of a place where we can imagine applying some machine learning. 
to actually quantify whether someone is emoting disgust or sadness, right? They're registering that on their face, whether they actually do or not, again, is a very difficult thing to suggest. Okay, let's come back to this point of quant uh, intensity and relaxedness. Can we try and quantify that a little bit? What features of the face register the intensity or relaxed state of the human? Or can we? The, the, the curvature, the, what do we call that, wrinkle? The wrinkles, right? Yeah. Exactly. So you can see pursed lips. You can see that some of the muscles in the face are actually tensed or relaxed, right? Now we're getting very close to a quantitative measure. Okay, so we're gonna now, again, we've gone a long way from the internal subjective feeling of emotions to the curvature of the lips and the uh, amount and depth of the wrinkles on the face. Can we actually start to now build up an algorithm to recognize emotion? Like you've already experienced now with KNN, we're gonna try and apply some machine learning. We're gonna just walk through a cartoon example here. This is not actually KNN. But any machine learning algorithm is going to require some input. We need to provide some data. There's a whole subculture in HCI about what features are relevant for recognizing emotion. In our case, let's imagine we're going to collect images uh, of faces. Assuming that the user is also wearing something, we might be able to get additional information. Accelerometers, as the name implies, give in, uh, information about acceleration of the head or possibly the hand. Uh, often the motion itself is not important, but the velocity and the acceleration is much more telling about the emotional state of the user. We mentioned uh, EMG uh, uh, last time uh, when we talked about the Libet experiment, electromyograph gives information about the, ele uh, the electrical activity of the muscles just under the, the skin. So did someone twitch or again, did they move quickly? Uh, respiration rates, heart rate, skin conductance. When someone is scared or concentrated or in a heightened uh, state, the sweat on the surface of the skin conducts electricity better than when they're relaxed. These are all things that could be useful if we're trying to recognize emotion. Once we have this input data, we're gonna try and extract some sort of patterns uh, from them, which we've talked about before. We might manually sit down and try and come up with some of these features like we just did on the previous slide, or we might use a more high-powered machine learning algorithm where we don't need to come up with the features ourselves. We provide, for example, raw pixel data from face images, and the machine learning algorithm itself finds relevant features. One of the interesting aspects of machine learning is you could train the machine learning algorithm on a bunch of faces, and if it gets good enough at predicting emotion, you can then query the machine learning algorithm and ask it, what aspects of the face were you focusing on when you made your correct predictions? Or sometimes even more interestingly, what features were you focused on when you made the wrong prediction? Okay, so how does it do that? Well, like KNN, it's gonna transform its features somehow of a new face that it receives to a prediction, right? Is this image of a face, is this face registering an emotion of anger, disgust, frustration, satisfaction, uh, and so on? You could imagine something very, very simple like a nested set of if-else statements. If the teeth are there and the lip is curved outward, then predict joy. If teeth are present but the brow is furrowed, that's the opposite. Okay. So, um, thinking about training this machine learning algorithm a little bit, like KNN, again, we need a training set. In this cartoon example here, we might have a large set of images of human faces, and we need labels for each of those images. Like in the iris data set, it was one of those three iris species. In the case of your KN, uh, in the case of your gesture data, it's which of the ten digits is the user did the user actually sign? In this case, we have images of faces, and that face actually is registering anger or is registering that they're satisfied. We take our machine learning algorithm, it makes one prediction for the first image of a human face. It predicts joy, but the actual emotional state was anger, minus one point. 
prediction of joy here, the user was pleased, satisfaction, joy, we'll give the machine learning algorithm one point for this. So I got one out of two, so let's restructure the decision tree or collect more training data for our KNN algorithm, restructure it in some way so that its predictions are increasingly accurate. And assuming we have enough data and a strong enough machine learning algorithm, we might be able to create some software and hook it up to a webcam where it's registering more or less in real time the emotional state of the user. Obviously, whether you would want to do that and in which domains this would be appropriate, that's an entirely diff different conversation. Okay. Okay, so let's switch things around now. So instead of a machine that's trying to recognize emotional being emotion being advertised by a, a user, why would we ever want to create a machine that does the same thing? As we mentioned last time, we talked about this idea of anthropomorphization. Humans have a particular cognitive bias, which is that they tend to attribute agency where often there is no agency. From an evolutionary and Darwinian point of view, if you're not sure whether something is animate or inanimate, or whether or not it has its own internal mental life or not, better to side, err on the side of caution and predict that it does have an internal mental life, it does have an emotional state, it is looking at you, and it is thinking about whether you'd be a tasty meal or not, right? Better to err on that side than assume it's inanimate and not interested in you. Okay, so we do that already. You can imagine creating technologies that exacerbate an anthropomorphization, right? We could add things in that really tune up that bias to attribute emotional state to an object, a technology, or a robot. This is one of the first uh, social robots that was created to do this. This is the Kismet robot uh, created at MIT. Uh, the next time you're in Boston, you go to the Boston Science Museum, you can see Kismet uh, in action at the, the museum. Okay, so uh, here is, we're gonna watch one video of Kismet and then Kismet's great, great, great grand uh, child, Jibo. Let's start with Kismet. Do you really think so? 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 Okay. So Kismet is obviously a, a living cartoon here, cartoonish on purpose. What are the various ways in which Kismet tries to tell you about its internal emotional state? The ears. Why the ears? There's a lot of uh, movement that you could, so there's a range of emotion that you could project onto ears. There's a range of emotion that are being advertised by Kismet's ears, but why? Excellent, right? So humans, most humans, can't waggle their ears, but there is a little bit of motion there in the ear that's associated with emotional uh, state. Is kismet a human? It's supposed to be a human? Is it supposed to be a... Animals will like to move like their ears back. Animals, right? So uh, a couple of species hit on this idea tens of thousands of years ago that humans tend to respond positively to certain projections of emotional state, and they evolved large floppy ears to exploit that property in humans. And just a few years ago, Kismet in turn has also built on that, that hack of human emotion. How else does Kismet advertise its emotional state? Tone of voice. Tone of voice. So in, a, in uh, an application we're going to look at in a couple of weeks, this idea of prosody is going to be very important. The way in which something is said communicates a lot of information in, above and beyond just what is said. Right? I apologize for the quality of the audio. Kismet is saying this, uh, do you think so, over and over again. 
But the way in which Kismet says it really tries to amplify the advertisement of its emotional state. How else does Kismet do this? It moves its head uh, up and down. Uh, it moves its head up and down. Why is it moving its head up and down? Again, humans do this a little bit in social interactions. Some animals do this, domesticated animals do this much more than humans. Why? When your center of shame is more of a submission to lowering your head. It's something about submission, right? Or, or, the, or the opposite, right? I'm superior to you, I'm the alpha, choose your species here, right? That is a signal not only of my recognition or my prediction about my social relationship with you, right? It is advertising the fact that I know something about you also. I know that you will be ashamed of what I just did, right? So again, this emotional advertisement, this is a very intimate social exchange that humans engage in with other humans. Animals have evolved to exploit. And we could, if we so chose, create robots to do the same thing. Domesticated animals had a very good reason for evolving to do so. It's not immediately obvious why we would want to create robots that do so, other than to help them with the robot rebellion that will eventually wipe us all out. Other than, other than human extinction, why might robots, why might we want to create robots that signal emotional state, and I know that you know that I know. Remember how from the beginning of this lecture. I feel much better that I told you that. I'm sorry that. Why might we want to create machines that try and advertise the fact that they are listening to us, they are sensitive to us, they share our feelings about something? Well, I've seen Pecker, the social robot. Okay. That's more of an indoor, Robot that's supposed to be for children, so you you buy one for a family. Okay. And um, to be able to interact with your children, the robot would have to take cues from the child to, to you know to be a friend or um, someone that the the child could project uh, human emotions onto. Which so to do that, you have to, it would have to be a two way. Um, you ha it have to be a two way street, right? An emotional exchange. Most. Human adults and especially human children will only engage in a social interaction if there's give, right? If it's if it's both ways. If you're talking to someone and they're looking off or looking at their phone, how much longer are you going to keep asking them questions and trying to engage their interest, right? Not very long. Especially when we're talking about effective uh, computing, we're now talking about expectations of social exchange. Most of what we've talked about so far is humans taking their in in expectations about the physical environment. I push against the physical environment, it push pushes back in this way. Now we're talking about our expectations and mental models of social interaction. Right? If I ask a question, if I push against my interlocutor, the person I'm speaking with, and they don't respond, or they don't make eye contact with me, or they look down at some third object between us, this exchange isn't working, there's no more point carrying on. Right? So assuming we want to create technology that engages humans, which is one of the most elusive of the non-functional HCI requirements we talked about, drawing the user in, it might be useful to create technology that quote unquote looks back at the user. Okay, so let's look at one of Kismet's descendants. This is the Jibo uh, home robot, this like, like Pepper. Car. This is your car. This, <laughs> this is your house. This is your car. This is your toothbrush. Sorry, this one is particularly quiet. Volumes, thank you. Let's try that again. This is your house. This is your car. This is your toothbrush. These are your things. But these are the things that matter. And somewhere in between is this guy. Introducing Jibo, the world's first family robot. Say hi, Jibo. Hi, Jibo. <laughs> Jibo helps everyone out throughout their day. He's the world's best cameraman. By intelligently tracking the action around him, he can independently take video and photos so that you can put down your camera and be a part of the scene. Jibo, take the picture. 
He's a hands-free helper. You can talk to him, and he'll talk to you back, so you don't have to skip a beat. Excuse me, Anne? Yes, Jibo. Melissa, just sent a reminder that she's picking you up in half an hour to go grocery shopping. Thanks, Jibo. He's an entertainer and educator. Through interactive applications, Jibo can teach. Let me in, or else I'll... Ha! And I'll... Ha! And I'll blow your house in! <laughs> hey, where'd you go? There you are. <laughs> He's the closest thing to a real-life teleportation device. He can turn and look at whoever you want with a simple tap of your finger. Check out my turkey dinner, Mom. I wish you wouldn't eat that. Hey, they make turkey pizza? I want turkey pizza. <laughs> and he's a platform, so his skills keep expanding. He'll be able to connect to your home. Welcome home, Eric. Hey, buddy. Can you order some takeout for me? Sure thing. Chinese, as usual? You know me so well. And even be a great wingman. You have a voice message from Ashley. Want to hear it? Absolutely. Hey, call me when you're home. Better make that takeoff for two, Jibo. We've dreamt of it for years, and now he's finally here. And he's not just an aluminum shell, nor is he just a three-axis motor system. He's not even just a connected device. He's one of the family. <laughs> Good night, Jibo. Jibo. This little bot of mine. Okay, who's gonna go out and buy a Jibo after class? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think you really clearly according to the ad, you need one for every room in your house. Absolutely, of course. <laughs> who's heard of the uncanny valley? Not quite a human, not quite inanimate, somewhere in between, right? We love zombies, we, lo we love Jibo, somewhere in between, something particularly creepy about Jibo. Unfortunately, you cannot buy a Jibo after class. The Jibo uh, Corporation, unfortunately, uh, went bankrupt last year. <laughs> Google Glass has come and gone. Jibo has now come and gone. The twist of this story is that the Jibo Corporation uh, went bankrupt not because no one was buying Jibo. It was outcompeted by Alexa. Alexa also obviously bit into the market for the potential market for Jibo. There are some other competitors for Jibo. So Jibo is not dead, it's just coming back in another form. What's that? Uh, Furby, there you go. I, I think Furby was the ancestor of both of these. Good, good point. Okay, so aside from the uncanny creepiness of Jibo, yes? So I honestly think that, that they did a, a fairly good job of avoiding the uncanny valley okay. by not actually trying to give it a face. Right? Jibo does not have a face, kind of has a face. Because, like, like whatever, whatever you see, like, the things that try to look like a human face, it always looks weird as hell. Okay, absolutely. Right? So there, there was clearly a lot of thought that went into Jibo. So Cynthia Brazil was the researcher at MIT who created uh, Kismet back in the 90s, and then she eventually spun off the Jibo Corporation. So Cynthia is one of the world thought leaders in this idea of social robotics. Nobody knows this idea better than Professor Brazil, so there clearly a lot of effort went in to try to make Jibo slightly, to sit outside the uncanny valley, and to try and engage in this case with various family members. So like we've talked a lot in HCI, they did a lot to try and remove unnecessary detail, right? Maximize the data to ink ratio. This is this idea in a different form, right? Let's not try and overkill and create something that is very human-like. We're gonna strip Jibo down to the bare essentials, but leave in just enough detail to advertise to whoever's interacting with Jibo that Jibo sees you and knows that you see it. How does it do so? Um, I just kind of a comment. Sure. Have you, if you've ever seen the movie Flubber with Robin Williams, okay. I feel like that's like a pretty <laughs> close to like 
consideration. They had a robot called Weibo. In it, oh, okay. They, they even showed, I have to go watch this one. I don't. They know showed a little clip of it in the ad, ah. actually, from that movie. Oh, they did. Also, oh, it was a nod to that. Oh, yeah. very nice. Okay. And, uh, I feel like they they based it for you because it appeals very emotionally to you in the movie. Exactly. That's a good point, right? So the movies for a long time have played with this idea of creating robots that actively try and engage with their human counterparts for better or for worse. So I think on the topic of movies that do a good job of like anthropomorphizing robots, Wally -E has often been cited. Similar, so right? Wally -E is like, also a minimal social robot. Yeah, and it does a really good job of avoiding that uncanny valley by making it obviously not human, but giving it like eyes that move around, eyebrows and whatnot, and like really expressive motion. Absolutely. So absolutely, there's, there's been a lot of ideas to try and do this before, and Jibo and Kismet were, are a few examples of actually trying to do this in reality. Let's come back to this idea of trying to quantify the advertisement of affect. I feel, or I know you, I can see that you feel dot, dot, dot. What are some of the features in Jibo that communicate Jibo's emotional state? Um, I, don't, I don't know if this is exactly it, but I know that humans put a lot of like effort and a lot of focus on watching each other's eyes. Absolutely, right? One of the building blocks of social exchange is watching each other's eyes. Jibo has an Jibo's eye. Jibo's is kind of just an eye. Just an eye, right? We can probably get rid of a lot of the other things. Absolutely, right? So even with without a mouth, it's, Jibo is still able to smile and laugh. What are some of the other small details or important details that are left in and everything else is removed? Absolutely, changing color, right? We blush, that's a big, big part of our emotional uh, portfolio. Can you make them angry? Can you make him angry? Good question. I don't know if I'd want to. You can try it. So Alexa was mentioned, right, which is, again, a, an even further stripped down version of a social agent trying to interact with humans. Jibo is a, is a robot. And as we mentioned uh, last time, a robot is distinguished from other technologies because robots can physically push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. Jibo has motors, it has just two motors, which allow it to move its head relative to its body, which obviously Alexa cannot do. She does not have a body. How does Jibo try and exploit those two motors to further amplify the human observer's anthropomorphic bias? So one of the things about Predator that they talk about is trying to emulate the human face. Okay. And um, Jibo has, the top is clearly a face and the bottom is a body. So it's, so it's paying attention to you by turning. It's paying attention to you. How is it, how is it indicating that it's paying attention to you? Um, the head will uh, focus on who the is speaking. The head tracks the human observer. Right. So uh, I have some colleagues who were working in the MIT lab around the time that Kismet was being built. There was another similar robot called COG. And at a certain point, they were actually working on the routines to be able to detect a face. And this was in the early 1990s. It was a very difficult thing to do at that time. And move the head to track the face. My friend was working late at night in the lab at MIT, and Cog was sitting quietly off in the corner, and every time my friend would move their head, suddenly Cog would turn and look at them, and then slowly look away, and would be still for another hour or two, and then my friend didn't spend much more time working late in the lab at, at MIT, as you can imagine. Okay, anthropomorphization, again, it's a very difficult thing to, to avoid. If you go back and watch the Jibo video, you'll notice there's lots of other subtle cues that Jibo uh, has to try and communicate emotional state and that it is socially engaged with you. In the little segment where the woman was uh, cooking something, baking something, Jibo was actually looking at her hands, not at her face. Why? Why is that important? Social interaction can also be very uncomfortable if all you do is look at the <laughs> other's face. Why was it looking at what she was doing with her hands rather than her face. What was the point of Jibo doing that? 
Maybe he's showing interest in what you are doing. Showing interest in what she was doing. Immediately after he looked at her needing uh, the bread, he said, excuse me, I'm sorry, but you have a call. What very atomic social interaction was going on there? It allows him to interrupt her in like a natural way. A natural Rather way. Just saying, like binging and giving a notification. Absolutely, right? So I see that you're busy. I see that you're doing something. So I'm sorry, I apologize, but you have an incoming call, right? Just that, yeah. subtle, that subtle change might make this a little bit more acceptable for some people over Alexa who just chimes in right at the worst possible moment with an alert, right? So there may be reasons why, and clearly Jibo and other examples from Hollywood have shown it's hard to get this right, right? To make this actually useful rather than just annoying. Okay, so assuming that we can do this, what, what is the point, right? So humans will engage in a social interaction for longer if they feel that the other is also engaged with them. Right? That can be useful in certain domains where the interaction itself is a little bit painful or frustrating or potentially boring for the human user. Examples of this, of course, are educational software. I know this is the hundredth version of your calculus homework that I've shown you, but bear with me. I, I, know, I feel your pain, uh, but it's really worthwhile. You signaled earlier you really want to push on. I know that you know that I know, and so on. Right. Duolingo's Owl, you can go and watch examples of that. There's a lot of this social robotics in there uh, to help you carry on learning uh, another language. There's some nice articles you can find out on the web about therapeutic software. So there's a lot of virtual reality technologies that are being developed to help uh, combat veterans coming back who suffer from PTSD. So gradually and very incrementally immersing them in difficult, uh, difficult situations, actually walking them through their fears and anxieties, and having an avatar or something who is very carefully aware of the emotional state uh, of the veteran uh, or the subject at that time, and is emoting along with them. I see that you're frightened or you're nervous about what's coming next, don't worry, I, I'll pull back if things get a little bit uh, too scary or too realistic. I see and I know that you know that I know and so on. So you can imagine certain domains where if you can do this right, it might be useful to create technology that is emotionally sensitive to the human participant. Okay, so let's move on to the third aspect, which is this idea of now not trying to just create a Jibo that interacts emotionally with the human participant, but also adapts its behavior based on what it's uh, sensing. So we'd like to try and adapt to elicit pleasure, positive emotions from humans. Again, what does that actually mean? Pleasure is a very... Uh, a very subjective idea, but we can, as always, try and divide and conquer. You can talk, or the psychology literature talks about physio pleasure, right? We enjoy things that are made well or look nice. Um, Apple seemed to get this right. Um, before Apple, there was an idea that computers were for the office and a beige uh, cube or rectangle was perfectly sufficient. One of the, genius, the geniuses of Apple, obviously, was this idea that computers and technology might be something that people like to look at and like to interact with. The personal computer was becoming more and more popular. It was moving out of the office. So let's try and create something that elicits physio pleasure. Obviously, most of the killer apps uh, these days are those that try and elicit social pleasure, right? Most of our apps are those that broaden or deepen the way that we engage in social interactions uh, with others. So like we just saw with Jibo, there are a lot of subtle dynamics that go on in social exchanges that we might want to try and support with social software so that the user walks away with a pleasurable experience. They were able to engage with friends that are distant uh, in a way that, that would have been difficult or impossible otherwise. What are some elements of social exchange that social networks support? So we just saw some robots that obviously focus on face-to-face -face social exchange, eye contact, head movement, facial expression, 
Assuming that we're just typing messages to each other, that's not available on a social network. How does how do social networks support social exchange? Emoji. Emojis, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of interesting. What element of written social exchange are the emojis supporting? Read an emoji, like ask an emoji, the, the col colon and yep. the, the square. The, fi the, fa the smiley face. Yeah, yeah, smiley face. Why the smiley face, the first emoji? The smiley and the sad face. They can so sometimes when you are reading, reading a written statement, it can be d difficult to interpret the author's emotions. So emojis can like indicate that. It's like a shorthand of like, this is meant to be a joke, or like, I'm not actually mad, or this is passive aggressive as heck. Absolutely, <laughs> right? So again, we're used, most of us, for the early years of our life at least, before we could read and write, we were used to social exchange face to face, right? Writing something to communicate your emotional state to another is a very difficult art, and now when you strip everything down to 40 characters or less, it becomes even more difficult. So humans have brought back the emotional element to written social exchange by inventing emojis, right? Kind of, kind of interesting. I think photos and videos are more common almost than text or emojis are in like today's social networks. Like Often, right? A, a lot of social exchanges, this is hilarious, I want to share this with you, right? Or this is important, I want to share this with you. So social networks also support the exchange of information and videos and images and audio and so on, which is sort of the content of the exchange. But the emojis are in many ways the metadata of the exchange, right? Is my you may not want to receive my image or video unless I send you the right emoji, right? Are you willing to engage in this interaction with me? It matters whether we're on the same emotional level or, or not. So we're distinguishing here between the content of what's being communicated and whether you want to actually engage in that interaction or not. Okay. Uh, Psycho pleasure. So again, we're moving from objective down to sort of more subjective. So does someone elicit, can we elicit a positive response even from an interaction that's frustrating or difficult? And this is again coming back to educational uh, software. Uh, there's lots of websites out there uh, about teaching uh, programming or learning a language. How do, you, how do you thread the needle between making things too easy and making things too difficult. We talked about this subjective experience of flow a few weeks back, right? If you hit that right on the nail, where someone can feel that despite the fact that this is difficult, they're making progress, they're learning, they're getting better, they're cognitively exhausted when they finish the exchange, but they have a sense of satisfaction from it, right? That's a particularly difficult mix of emotions to detect and support during uh, an exchange. Finally, idio pleasure. This one is particularly difficult, right? We all have particular philosophical slants and ideologies. Perhaps we would prefer to use open source software that has fewer functions or is more buggy than a corporate version of the software simply because open source software aligns with our own ideology, right? Perhaps we would choose a technology that reports its carbon footprint over an alternate technology that, that does not, right? Almost impossible for the technology itself to detect that unless you ask the user. These are sort of open challenges in the field of affective <coughs> computing. Okay. I think that concludes our discussion of affective computing, and we're going to switch gears now and start in on this theme of looking outward. What do I mean by looking outward? In looking outward, we're now going to talk about technologies that are deployed out into the wild. So in all of these examples here, these are not web, uh, nicely designed websites. Uh, these are not apps in and of themselves. These are technologies that have one foot in the digital world and one foot in the physical world. The moment we deploy technology into the real world, the technology itself has to deal with the physical world. 
if that technology is interacting with many people who are also embedded in the physical world, it has to be cognizant of or pay attention to the complex social dynamics going on among uh, the group and try and participate in that in an intelligent manner. And that's where we're going to start our discussion of looking outward today with this idea of crowdsourcing. So we're going to look at technologies now that try and harness the power of the group. OK. So we'll do this mostly chronologically. Um, and I'm showing my age here by remembering playing with SETI at home. Some of you may have also remembered this from the very late uh, 90s. Uh, you too, if you had a personal computer, could help search for little green men. All you had to do was download SETI at home and run this as a screensaver when your computer was not otherwise engaged. What aspects of affective computing does, did SETI at home try and engage. Mm, it kind of uh, tell you you are helping the humankind. You're helping humans, right? Find little green men. What aspect of the four dimensions of pleasure that we just talked about is that relying on? Why would someone bother? Uh, maybe ideal. Ideological pleasure, right? I want to help humans answer the question of are we alone or not? Of course, there is something that could be learned here. You can learn about what's actually going on under the hood in SETI at home. But for most people, it was, well, most of my time, my, my desktop computer sits idle and not a lot's going on. So why don't I put those idle cycles to good use, right? SETI at home. You'll notice that there was also a lot of fancy graphics, at least in terms of the late uh, 90s, to try and engage people. It was flashy. It was interesting. There were a lot of things going on. Uh, I don't know if City at Home still exists. It would be an interesting thing to, to look into. Uh, this led to the Boink project many years later, uh, which I think is still going. Um, if you're co computationally savvy and you have a very computationally intensive uh, task, you can write your own Boink application, upload it to the Boink uh, website, and then someone might choose your application to run uh, in the spare cycles on their CPU. Next, might be hard to see from the cartoon here, somebody's working on computing very large uh, prime numbers. Uh, there's also a lot of therapeutic uh, cancer uh, detection software running. Uh, you can sort of choose and make a menu of the various projects that you would like to computationally contribute to. Yet again, a nod to ideological pleasure. I want to choose how I'm going to help mankind. Back in, uh, actually just shortly after SETI at Home, uh, Berkeley released the Folding at Home project. So instead of looking for little green men, I want to try and help figure out how to fold proteins. Turns out that this is a very difficult problem. If you have the primary uh, structure of a protein, you can think of it as a string of different colored uh, beads, if you let that protein go, it will fold up into a particular three-dimensional three structure. This is an ongoing problem. If I give you a set of sequences, a nucleotide uh, sequence of proteins, can you create a machine learning algorithm that will predict the 3D structure that it will fold up into? Why is this such an important problem? Because protein uh, act uh uh, all the protein's function uh, comes from their 3D uh, shape. Absolutely. So uh, the sequence leads to 3D shape, and the 3D shape leads to function. Why does that matter? So ultimately, we're trying to predict sequence to function. Help humankind. <laughs> Help humankind, of course, right? Yeah. So uh, we want to design a new drug or detect uh, a deleterious mutation. Protein folding is an extremely important and still more or less open problem. So uh, you could run folding at home as a screensaver and, and watch the computer try and fold the, the sequence of different color beads into the right uh, shape. The researchers who created folding at home started to get uh, emails from users who spent hours watching the screensaver, and they wrote in and they, say, they said, I know how to do this better than your fancy algorithm. I can see how to fold this better, but I can't. It's just a screensaver. 
I wish I could reach in and fix the folding pattern that your computer is, or your algorithm is trying to come up with. That was somewhat surprising to the researchers at the time because this is a problem that's usually worked on by uh, uh, organic chemists at the PhD level and above. It's a very, it seemed like a very difficult problem restricted to experts or machine learning algorithms and non-experts were indicating that they knew how to do better. So the Berkeley team made Foldit back in 2008 to see if that was actually true. So, uh, so they basically gamified folding at home. So we're gonna distinguish in this lecture between crowdsourcing which is we're gonna try and get the crowd to help us with something, and gamification, which is incentivize the crowd to help us do something. It turns out that uh, you can go and play Folded at home, and it turns out that a lot of non-experts actually did do much better than not just the machine learning algorithm but some of the PhD students that were supposed to be experts at predicting uh, structure from sequence. How's that possible? How could non-experts be good at this seemingly expert task? If it's based in pattern recognition and you have an external perspective, so you're not staring at it all day, every day for like eight to 14 hours, you can see things that people who have been like embedded in it, embedded in it might miss. Absolutely, right? So all academics, after a while, we start to grow intellectual blinders and we see our pet uh, project in a particular way. Non-experts often come in without those intellectual blinders and they see something we miss. You remember a few weeks ago we talked about the brain. It's a prediction machine. It fills in errors for us as we go, but often an outsider sees the errors that the expert's brain was filling in and skipping over on the expert's behalf. But why this particular problem? Absolutely, the non-experts were recognizing a pattern. What pattern and what experiences from the real world are we bringing to bear on this problem? How would a non-expert know how to package this sequence into a tighter uh, structure than uh, the experts? Because the software will identify it and hide all the uh, background knowledge behind those sim simplify the symbols and uh, rules. Possibly, right? So the experts designed this interface to hide what the experts felt were extraneous detail and are only signaling here the relevant information that the non-expert needs to perform the folding. But non-experts in some cases did better than the experts. What, what, what are the non-experts drawing on? How can they possibly be able to do this without actually having any formal training in protein folding. You said that um, you're missing runs on the, in the background on the screen for the person. The folding at home does. Folded is a video game. You reach in and you actually do the folding. Once, you, once the user does the folding, the computer actually measures the quality of the fold and you get points. So there is like the reaction, action to reaction. Yep, possibly. There might, it might have been that Folded helps because it accelerates the trial and error loop, right? I can try things in a really nice interface very quickly and vet different ideas, which if you're an expert, usually you do this in a computer simulation and maybe your cycles of trial and error are not as long. You're, you're exploiting the human's brain's ability to pattern match without brute forcing it. What exactly, but what pattern matching are we relying on here? I'm just thinking it's going from past experiences, so I don't know how this works, but I assume you're not allowed to touch anything, so you're just drawing on past snake players. You're just like hoping to make this work as closely as possible without losing the game. Possibly. So you build up an expertise of playing the game, but again. Some were gamers, but some of the non-experts who did very well were not gamers. What is, what is it from the 20 or 30 or 40 years of experience we have from the physical world? What from that experience helps you fold proteins? 
Most of us haven't folded proteins before playing fold it. Puzzles. Puzzles, getting closer, yeah. Tricky, right? It's not immediately obvious. We have a lot of experience with three-dimensional space, right? We've existed in it for 20 or 30 or 40 years. We observe how things twist in the world or uh, twist in the wind or fold when we bunch up the pieces of paper. Again, we probably can't do it consciously, but we have intuitions about how things move and interact and push or pull against one another in three-dimensional space. And that may, this is just a hypothesis, that may be the specific intuitions that we're drawing on that allowed non-experts to do well at this task. Some of the users are gamers. Some of them are, have, like to play puzzles. All of us have experiences with how things twist and fold and uh, brush up against one another in three-dimensional space. Somehow that allows non-experts with the right interface to make significant progress on aspects of the fo protein folding problem. That was a big eye-opener back in the, uh, the mid-2000s. Question? Could that also just be a sheer number of people? So like, if you have like 10 experts that are working on it, you might think, oh, you know, you have 2,000 people, so we'll learn this yet. Absolutely, the power of numbers, right? That's also a big part of crowdsourcing. We're gonna send something out there and hope that at least one person can do well at this. HCI recognizes that there is diversity in the human population. Somewhere out there, if enough people play, there is someone who is a gamer and loves puzzles and for some reason has a pre more higher than average ability to uh, reason in three-dimensional space and that person makes progress, right? Let's cast as wide a net as we can. Okay. Uh, there's some other attempts to gamify things. Uh, I don't know if anybody remembers the ESP game. This is a simple game you could play on the web. Uh, an image was thrown up in the middle of the screen. You were randomly matched up with some, another, some other anonymous participant on the web. You didn't know who it was. And each of you typed in keywords in response to what you saw in the image. And you both get a point if you both type in the same keyword which doesn't show up here, but should be that both users typed in the word tree, you both get a point. Another image, another photograph comes up, you're paired up with another anonymous participant, and around and around you go. Google has a game like that now. Google has a game like they... And you're supposed to draw, and if the um, machine remain algorithm figures out what you're drawing quickly, you yep. get the point, versus the other person drawing. Absolutely, right? So this is now a, a, a pretty common idea out there on the web. You can tell from the date here, this is a little dated, why did the, what is the ESP game helping, what problem is it helping to solve? You know what the folded game is trying to help, the problem it's trying to help solve. What's the problem that we're trying to help solve here? Absolutely. So this was actually the beginning of labeling data on the web. This is where, more or less, where it all started with the ESP game, right? At this time, there were advances going on in machine learning that were starting to realize that if you had enough images and you had enough tags on those images, you could train a computer to find the tree in the landscape photo. And then the realization occurred that we just don't have enough labeled photos. So how do we go about solving the problem of collecting enough labeled photos? Let's turn it into a game and get the crowd to do it for us. Exactly. Okay. All right. Let's move forward in time uh, again. As we just mentioned, we would like to try and cast a wide a net as we can for a given problem with the hope that there is someone out there that has the necessary abil ability or just blind luck to have the right skills, or in the case of DARPA's Red Balloon Challenge, to be in the right place at the right time. If you've seen the Red Balloon Challenge before and you know the answer, hold on to that. Let me tell you what the problem is, and then let's see if you can come up with the answer. DARPA back in 2009 put out some big red balloons. I think there were a couple of feet uh, across. They put 10 balloons at various unrevealed locations in the continental United States. They're the actual locations. And the game, the red balloon challenge, was to find all 10 red balloons. 
not an easy problem. This isn't a needle in the haystack problem. It's 10 needles in a very, very large haystack. So we've got about a little less than 300 million par potential participants and 10 things that need to be found. Not trivial. Whichever team reported the latitude and longitude of the 10 red balloons got a prize of, I'm forgetting the number, is it 10,000? Does anybody remember? Somewhere around there, $10,000, I think. We'll use that for now. OK. So seems like kind of an odd game for DARPA to play. Why would they care? There's lots of reasons you can imagine. Recruiting. Recruiting, possibly. Turns out that the Red Balloon Challenge, the game is not actually to find the 10 balloons. The game is to find the algorithm, the crowdsourcing algorithm, that enables 10 people an algorithm, a crowdsourcing algorithm that enables a group to find the 10 balloons. So the, dark, the red balloon challenge is actually not a crowdsourcing problem. It's a crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing problem. Right? It's a little, little meta here. DARPA wanted, obviously wants to try and incentivize the development of crowdsourcing algorithms. And the quality of that algorithm is how many people can be recruited to perform perhaps a search and rescue task or some other task that is distributed over a wide range and a very short period of time. Um, the uh, DARPA mentioned they would put up these balloons and they were only going to be up, I think, for about two weeks. Many teams congealed around this problem and tried to solve this problem about finding the 10 balloons. And in, I think it was about 10 hours time, one team reported the exact latitude and longitude of all 10 uh, balloons. And as far as anybody knows, they didn't hack into DARPA's server. They actually solved the problem. How would you go about solving this problem? Remember, the problem is not to find the red balloons. The problem is to design a crowdsourcing algorithm that recruits enough people to find the balloons. Well, I think with something like this, if I remember correctly, it was sort of... Don't give away the answer if you know the answer. Broadcast publicly. It's broadcast publicly, right? So, so you, you everybody who could see the balloons was like tweeting or, or taking pictures of them and putting them up online. So you just have to find a way to sift through all of those and triangulate the locations of the actual balloons. So that's, you're sketching out a possible solution, right? So this is 2009, social media is pretty much prevalent. You can just hope that people post enough images of red balloons and you somehow write an algorithm that scrapes as many social networks as possible, as broadly as possible, and you, as a member of the team, find all 10 red balloons. That's one way, which is sort of the, the, the passive uh, way of doing this. We'll just try and search what's already out there on the web. What else could we do? Was ham radio. What's that? Was ham radio. Ham radio? Yeah. Okay, possibly we could try and get people using other modalities other than social media. Absolutely, right? So I'm going to I'm gonna win the ten thousand. I'm gonna assume I'm gonna win the ten thousand. So I'm gonna pay five thousand for a TV channel to broadcast it. Remember that the balloons are throughout the continental United States, so I don't know much about broadcasting, but I imagine it would be hard to buy airtime to reach enough people to find all 10 balloons. Maybe. I think maybe you just check those uh, other user, other competitors' uh, address, because you, when you see a balloon, you probably uh, come to this challenge. Maybe, maybe you could try and look at other teams. So it's incentivize the forum or the comments section of the challenge. Ah. Say, if you have a location, let us know. You join the team, we're going to distribute the prize money throughout whoever goes in. Okay, so now we're talking about incentivization, right? So we could try and cast our web as our net as wide as possible, scrape social networks, scrape ham radio channels. We could try and broadcast to as many people as possible, but none of those things yet have anything to do with incentivization. Even if I saw your TV commercial, why would I bother reporting the location of the balloon? So you mentioned we incentivize people in what way? Just distributing the cash. Distribute the cash. So if you tell me where a red balloon is, I'll give you a cut of the 10,000. 
Okay, so now we're on another related aspect of crowdsourcing, which is relates back to our discussion about uh, affective computing, right? We need to incentivize people to participate. It's not immediately obvious on the surface how finding these red balloons is gonna help humanity. So we can't rely on sort of people's general goodwill, like in SETI at home and folding at home. So we could incentivize people. We need to communicate the fact that we will give you a cut of the money if you report the red balloon. How do we get the word out? You could put it on your social network feeds and hope for the best. Could we do something better than that? Maybe they just uh, give a name to their team so everyone can share. We, you name your team something cool. You can be part of this team if you participate and report. Uh, no, we just uh, name this team like uh, everyone gets. Oh, oh! If you if you report a balloon, your name becomes uh, yeah, yeah. part of the. Yeah, that's right. Like a law firm, you'll be part of the name. The name, right? Possibly. Is that enough? Are we going to reach enough people to find all ten red balloons? Probably not. Okay, so the team that actually won was at MIT, and most of the teams that participated were at uh, academic institutions. So if you're a member of MIT, maybe you draw on the resources and the social capital of MIT to help you. Maybe. So that even with MIT's might behind you, and they broadcast on their social feeds, is that going to be enough? to alert enough people that if they find a red balloon, they should report it to the MIT team. I guess from the way I'm phrasing this question that it's probably not, right? So all of the ideas so far, which are good ideas, we're trying to blast out our message to incentivize somebody to find the red balloon. But in that case, we're gonna have to hope that our social network broadcasting is going to reach all 10 people that eventually find all 10 balloons. And DARPA did this on purpose so that that is not gonna be enough. So we cannot rely on incentivizing people to find red balloons. We need to incentivize them to do something else. What is it? Let's say I participate in this contest. I'm one person, I've got whatever, 100, contacts on my social network, it's unlikely that my 100 friends are going to find the 100 balloons, even if I promise them a cut of the money. So I'm going to promise them a cut of the money if they find the red balloon or if they, if they share on their social media. Getting closer. So they might now broadcast to their social media because I'm going to give them a cut of the money. Why know? should my friend's <laughs> friends want to br broadcast it? If somebody actually finds it, the spreading of the money comes back. So the winner, the winning algorithm was a recursive incentivization strategy. I am incentivizing you not to find the red balloon. I'm incentivizing you to incentivize your peers. Is that a nice way of saying it was just a pyramid scheme? It is exactly a pyramid <laughs> scheme, absolutely. This is the state of the art in a pyramid scheme done right. The person that finds the balloon, uh, sorry, it was $20,000 was the actual prize. So if Dave finds the balloon, he gets a cut of, nope, I take it back, 40,000 is the total prize. So we take 40,000 and we divide it into 10 bins, 4,000 each. The person that finds the red balloon gets half of the 4,000 pot dedicated to that balloon. The person that recruited them gets half of that. The person that recruited them gets half of that, and the person that recruits them gets half of that. So if we're having the pot of 4,000, then regardless of how long the branch of that tree is, we don't exhaust the 4,000. It will always sum to a sum less than 4,000, and whatever's remaining from that 4,000 was donated by the MIT team to charity. Right? Yes, pyramid scheme. There you go. All right, good place to end. You have a quiz due tonight. You're working on Deliverable 7. I'll see you next Tuesday.